Hi guys and welcome back and today we're going to do the diorama base for the uh, current diorama JRH with Darwin 1942. So let's get stuck into it and there's my very detailed plan for the foam where I want the gun placement and the wheel tracks for the road and also a little fire pit. So I marked all that out with the pencil and then started to carefully cut away with um, my X-Acto knife. So it's pretty obvious what I'm doing here. I'll leave you with some music and you can watch me cut foam without cutting myself for the first time. So then it was uh, on with the clay. So this is just Mr. Clay. I really like it. It's very fine consistency, so and it smooths down really nicely. And just found, uh, as a little tip, it was um, a bit tricky sticking it to the timber. But if I wet the timber with a bit of water, then it stuck quite nicely. So just wanted a reasonably thin layer across the foam in particular. And what I discovered by mistake when I was doing the Jag Panther diorama base, in the areas around where the house was, where there was no foam or there was just a little bit of foam on the slope, I actually had a problem there. I don't think I highlighted it when I did that video, that the clay was... Um, cracking just a little bit but it was cracking a little bit and that was easily fixed. In this particular instance on the foam especially around the road area and the ground area where the fire pit is I wanted some cracks so I, I deliberately hoped for that outcome by putting it on as thin as I could but still getting some texture into it and then when it was dry just pushing down there was some give in the foam un underneath it so it created a couple of nice little cracks which are typical of um, the dried out soil up in the in the northern territory in in the middle of summer so uh, I was happy with how that came out.
So the next thing to do is uh, I needed to make a couple of hundred sandbags for the gun emplacement. And uh, I've always felt, and um, this is more a comment in my own past production of sandbags, that I've never got the scale quite right. And I've always just done it by eye and they always feel a little bit too fat and a little bit too big. So I did a little bit of research and found there was a sort of range and a generally accepted range of 36 by 66 centimetres up to 48 by 81 centimetres and so I settled for somewhere in the middle at the 40 to 73 mark so just templated that out with my uh, 135th scale ruler and then just made a test one which felt right looked right to me and um, settled on that as the as the basic sandbag. So then I went into production mode and unashamedly stole this idea from the terrain tutor who had marked up a um, piece of greaseproof paper with the width of the roll of the clay uh, or the green stuff or whatever your material is uh, and then another parallel set of lines with the width of it uh, once you've compressed it so it's nice and flat and then just the little dots across the, the middle there to give the actual length and then I've just got a little box in the top right hand corner to do a check to make sure that it's uh, within range and uh, I just did this on the back of a on the back of like a bathroom tile which allowed me to roll out the clay quite nicely and um, also perhaps a little bit more durable than uh, grease proof paper so that seemed to work okay. Now I like the FIMO clay and I've been using the, the uh, modelling clay that you have to bake in the oven. This is different, this is an air dry one and I think slightly disappointed um, not because of the product just because of my choice. This doesn't take the detail as well as the oven bake version does and and certainly probably neither of them take the detail as well as the milliput the green stuff does but look for mass production it worked quite well and uh, I think I got enough detail into it for it to look um, reasonably convincing but yeah a little bit too soft to work with and just a little bit a little bit of extra mucking around that I probably wasn't planning to have to do especially when you've got to make a couple of hundred of them uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time on each one if I did it over again, I think I'd definitely go for the oven bake variety. So at this point, once I had the sandbags up, I realised the fire pit was in just the most ridiculous position right near the entry point and you just wouldn't have it there and people would be tripping over it and the log. So that meant it needed to be moved. Not a huge deal, but just carved it out carefully from where it was to try and retain the integrity of the stonework that I'd done and just moved it into the other corner and then filled it all up and relocated the log. So it, look, it came out okay in the finish and uh, it makes more sense to be where it is now. But uh, just, I think, a good indication that when you're planning stuff on paper, it all 
sort of makes sense, but it's only when you actually start to see it come into three-dimensional life that uh, you realise, well, gee, that, that's a pretty stupid place to have that. So I guess my advice would be, because I was a little reluctant to change it, and common sense had to prevail over, I, I guess, the lack of desire to do the extra little piece of work, but I'm glad I changed it because I think it looks much better where it is now. And the other piece of learning that I had from all of this was the uh, FIMO airbag clay doesn't actually adhere to itself when it dries, so I had to remove all the individual sandbags in the right order because they were all obviously custom fitting based on the pressure I'd put on them and the, and the shape, and then put them all back again with some white glue. So just whiz through this. I wish it had taken only this long. It took a lot longer in uh, in real life. And at this point, it was really just starting to muck around with all the other bits and pieces to dress the diorama. So I really like, this is um, really fine wire, and it comes in um, garbage bag ties uh, over here in Australia. And uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it, it's like point zero one of a millimeter or something but it's it's strong but it's very thin and you can do pretty much anything you like with it in terms of shape so just starting to build a little domestic background scene onto the base and uh, this is just a clothesline that the crew have knocked together just putting a few little things like this in place to uh, add a little bit of extra i guess color to the to the scene So on with the painting, and uh, I'll try and be a little bit more informative about what paints I actually use. So virtually all my paints are Vallejo, and this is uh, German black brown, and I tend to use that as the base colour um, for all my groundwork uh, to get a good depth of uh, shade in as the base. And from there it was just adding different uh, tones and I used a lot of the rust colours uh, to bring that red earth sort of um, Central Australian Darwin type colour scheme through and then some light rust shadow there. A little bit more in the gun pit itself, it would be a bit more scuffed up in there I think. Then some uh, washes of, uh, this is leather brown, I'm working on the sandbags mainly now to try and bring out a little bit of uh, detail and highlights uh, through through that process. And Panzer Ace's new wood, again just washes of. And then that's um, khaki grey. And then went through the exercise of just using different varieties of the tones, adding a little bit of white or a little bit of brown along the way and picking out individual bags just to mix it up and break the, the solidness of the, of the colour. So I think that came out reasonably nicely. And then finished that painting process with a oil wash, again, the burnt sienna and a, and a little bit of vermilion and white spirit and got that into uh, all the nooks and crannies.
and then moved on to do the uh, the grasses. So I've used the normal just to scatter um, grass, the little very fine particles, which is what I'm putting on now. And I was looking for that dry dry summer grass uh, that we get over here, so quite yellow in colour, with the caveat that around the edge of the sandbags uh, right here, uh, I also wanted to put a little bit of um, green tufting, and I'll go back and show that in a in a little while. Uh, just use the Woodland Scenic white glue, which is basically just PVA glue and water, so you could make your own. Uh, but it flows very nicely and, it's, and it sticks quite well. And scatter that on pretty thickly, and then once it's uh, dried, then I shake it off and try and save the surplus. So I shake it off onto some paper and put that back in the bag. So you don't waste a huge amount. Uh, but I, th I find if you don't put it on thickly, um, you don't get a good coverage. So this is just putting the, uh, I think, Army Painter tufts on. Just a little bit of white glue on the bottom of those. And just ran them along the two edges here, just to give a little bit of colour and, and brighten it up a little bit. Uh, I figure that if it's going to grow anywhere, it'll grow with the shade of the, of the sandbags. And then on to putting in static grass. Now, I've never done this before, and in fact, I had to go and buy a static grass applicator. So this is one from Ground Up Scenery, and uh, I have no prior experience whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but um, part of the problem with my first attempt was operating the machine correctly, and you'll you'll see that in a, in a second. But uh, look, theoretically very simple to use, and um, I was really happy with the result, even though I didn't use it very well on my first attempt. I mixed two blends together, so I think it's pronounced knock, which is winter grass, which has got that nice uh, yellow tone to it. Added a little bit of the ground up summer blend, which was a little bit greener, and it was probably a 90-10 mix for those. And look, theoretically, the operation pretty simple. You put a, a nail in uh, and attach a little clip to that so the current's going through, and uh, then you scatter the grass on. And of course, if you hold the yellow button down, the current actually gets into the base and helps it stand up. Now, luckily, it stood up anyway, and I think that was the static from the shaking the way I was doing it, but um, I didn't realise it until right at the very end that I hadn't done it right. So to just do some additional um, dressing of the of the diorama base, I decided I'd make a thing called a Coolgardie safe, which is a uh, air evaporative safe that was pretty popular back in the early 1900s and certainly right through to um, the 50s or 60s here. Basically, it was a um, open sided shelf or drawer, and um, the sides were draped with hessian or flannelette or whatever material you could get. And a, and a tray of water placed on top and the water kept the hessian moist and the air um, provided evaporative cooling so I just wanted to have something a little bit different and something a bit Australian in in the diorama so I made that from a um, plastic card and then made the tray from the metal from the um, tea light that I use. Uh, other bits and pieces I wanted to put some uh, helmets on display hanging from hooks so I um, just had the basic helmets that came with the both is set so I wanted to make the liners for those and this is just the foil from uh, a wine bottle uh, the lead from a wine bottle and uh, a little bit fiddly but uh, again I think it just added a little bit of realism to the to the overall effect and then I wanted to try something different with the barrel so I used the salt effects technique to bring the rust out and um, normally once that's done, you'd scrape it off with a toothbrush, but I found when I did that last time, it was a bit too rough. So I thought what might be gentler would be just to completely immerse it in water, and hopefully that would uh, not do too much damage to the paint. It worked reasonably well. In fact, it worked a little bit better than I'd hoped because it softened the top coat. The rust I had sealed with um, dull coat, 
So it softened the top coat a little bit, so I, I got the paint off all right to reveal the rust. And it also let me do a little bit of um, folding over of the top coat. And I quite like that because out uh, in the extreme heat, 42, 45 degrees, um, paint will get soft and uh, and it can get some funny sort of appearances to it. So anyway, I had a bit of fun playing around with that for a little while. The, the tragedy is that um, with my bad eyes, you can't really see it in person. It's only when you zoom in on it or take the photos that it, uh, that it shows up. But uh, we all know it's there now and... Uh, and I like it. So I just have a, a minor whinge and it's actually harking back to the Bronco kit of the Bofors gun and this is the ammunition and the spent um, cartridge or shell casing that come with the kit. Now their ammunition looks fine and I've checked it against other brands and it's pretty much the same size but the sh spent shell casing is actually bigger than the entire round uh, in the clip of four which was just doing my head in. Now I hope I'm not completely wrong and that's just not some other sort of shell but it doesn't make any logical sense that it is and I'm not aware of anything that would be bigger than the actual 40 millimeter rounds that it fired so I think it's just horribly out of scale and uh, it's just hard to understand how they could get it so wrong. And last of all I just mucked around with a few other little bits and pieces to um, add a little bit of colour to the overall scene. And so that's pretty much it. All that's left to do is a little bit of work with the uh, soft pastels to uh, get a little bit of uh, shade and texture into some of the surfaces. Really enjoyed putting this together. I found it interesting. I had to learn a few new things. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching it come together as well. So I'll uh, leave you with a bit of a slideshow now for a min couple of minutes and uh, then come back and say goodbye. So thanks very much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed it. The next one will be the figures and I'm really looking forward to the figures so there'll be a little bit of customization there and a little bit of sculpting which I quite enjoy doing and then the final reveal. So thanks very much for your time and if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe so you can stay current with the, with the new releases as they come out. Thanks again, bye.